th this is the story. The Israeli sent a drone, and the drone sent a missile, or launched a missile into the uh, part of the residence where he was staying. Mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, first of all, that shows a very pinpointed location. They didn't blow up the entire residence. You see, I've seen pictures of the residence, and like just one corner of it has been uh, yeah. has been struck. So it like literally just went right to wherever wherever his room is uh, was. Uh, so one report is that this dr the uh, drone would have been launched from Israel uh, and then gone all the way to Iran and to Tehran to carry out this uh, assassination. Now I've heard another report which says that it was launched inside of Iran, not inside of Israel. Uh, and then the rest of the story is the same. A Lebanese reporter who was citing uh, anonymous sources from inside Israeli intelligence has said that uh, he was targeted via WhatsApp, that he apparently, uh, that, that the Israelis had put some kind of a tracking software, uh, delivered it to him via WhatsApp, which as far as I understand how these things work, would mean that he must have gotten a message on WhatsApp <coughs> that he then downloaded a file or something, uh, which enabled them to track him. Now, uh, as we were talking about the other day, and as we were talking about on the Telegram group, uh, nine times out of ten, when there's an Israeli assassination of a, of a top guy, uh, it's because of a snitch. Yeah. It's because of an informer. It's because of an informant. It's because a, a, a traitor, someone who betrayed this person, and uh, pointed them out uh, to the Israelis and told them where where to find him. Uh, the Israelis always like to pretend like it's all about their their master uh, master surveillance and their master spy skills, but it right. usually just comes down to a snitch, just like most police work. It's it's usually a snitch. There's very little actual investigation that goes on in the world. It's usually snitches. Yeah. And the same is the case for uh, the Israelis. Whenever they uh, conduct a hit on somebody, it's usually because of an informer. Um, I'm inclined to believe that that's what happened in this case. Uh, because also, the story about it being WhatsApp is not that plausible. The plausibility of him using WhatsApp is questionable, although it's not impossible that... I mean, I'm, 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 I'm also... I don't want to speak ill of the, the deceased, uh, but Hamas generally is incompetent and and uh, and negligent and lackadaisical uh, on the political level, not on the um, militant level. But the the political uh, faction, uh, so the political wing of Hamas, uh, I haven't been terribly impressed with uh, their expertise and seriousness. That's my personal opinion. You can take it for uh, what it is. But still, it's not that plausible. It's not that plausible. And also because then the added, the, the added side of that is that he has to have been silly enough to have downloaded a file mm -hmm. from someone uh, that enabled it. But again, maybe there's another way to, to load these things. I don't know. Anyway, in my opinion, it's not that plausible. So I'm inclined to believe that it was uh, a setup, that he was, uh, someone fingered him, uh, you know, uh, someone was a snitch, someone informed, and, uh, and gave his location to the Israelis. I'm further inclined to believe that the one who gave his location to the Israelis was the Iranians. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that the, the story of a drone going all the way from Israel to Iran and into, inside of their airspace and all the way to Tehran uh, on the night of the day that the president was inaugurated and during the uh, current uh, circumstances and situation, the conditions being what they are. Come on, I don't. I, I don't believe that that Iran wouldn't be like if we're if we're going to believe that there's this hostility between Iran and Israel. Uh, then they will be watching Israel at all times. At 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 this moment, especially, they will keep their eyes on Israel at all times and the the airspace, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, it's not believable to me. I'm not a military guy, but it's not convincing to me that that's a thing that could have happened. Now. The other, the other story is that it was launched from inside of Iran, in which case it maybe wouldn't have raised as many red flags, but that in and of itself raises red flags that you have this kind of uh, thing operating inside your country. Mm -hmm. uh, and the main thing is, how did they target him? The attack was very precise. As I said, they didn't blow up the entire residence. They just hit the one spot exactly where he was, mm -hmm. which to me says someone told, him, told them this is exactly where he is. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, in my opinion, Iran is the one who did that. Mm -hmm. Now, the question to me is: uh, Okay, let, okay. First of all, let's just go with let's just go with the official narrative. The official narrative that uh, Israel did this; nobody knew about it. Iran didn't cooperate. Mm -hmm. 
uh, didn't collaborate or, or coordinate it with them, and it wasn't an orchestrated hit uh, between them. But uh, Israel just took this bold move. Okay, why would they do it? What would be the, the motive? What would be the uh, desired outcome? The, the, the standard logic is that they want to provoke a war with Iran. Um, I've, heard, I've heard some geopolitical, uh, so-called geopolitical analysts saying that uh, it's the desire of Israel and the, the desire of Netanyahu to pull America into a wider war. Uh, that they're un they, they are not able to pull America into a war with Hamas, but they might be able to drag them into a war with Iran. Because uh, heaven knows Washington has no interest uh, in a war with Iran. It's not like something that they've been talking about for 30 years. Um, so that, that in and of itself is also not really believable. Uh, I mean, that, that idea that, uh, of um, that, that they're going to pull America into a war with Iran uh, is silly. Uh, Israel does, does America's bidding. It's not because they want to pull America into a war, it's because America wants a war. So why would America want a war, and do they really? The neocons have always wanted a war with Iran. How feasible is it for them to go to war with Iran? What's the what's what's the outcome of that going to look like? Okay, okay I mean let's 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 look at what would happen if they attack Iran. If there's a war, first of all, the 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 focal point of the war will exclusively be Iran. Uh, Iran will uh, retaliate against who they can retaliate against, which would be uh, Israel and American interests in the region. A and they've made it clear also in a uh, speech, uh, Khamenei, I think, made a speech where he said that, uh, or no, sorry, sorry, it wasn't a speech, it was a, it was a statement, it was a statement from the, uh, maybe the foreign minister, I'm not sure, uh, saying that uh, they hold America responsible for Israel's actions because Israel can't do anything without American uh, funding cool. and, and financing and, and sponsorship. So in other words, they're saying, that if there's going to be a wider war between us and Israel, it will also be between us and you, between Iran and the United States. Which means we're letting you know, we're giving you a heads up that obviously, it doesn't need to be said, but we're saying it anyway, we will attack your interests in the region. Okay. There, uh, we'll attack all of your interests that we can reach, mm -hmm. which will be in Iraq, which will be in Syria, which will be in the, in the Kharij, in the Gulf, in mm -hmm. Qatar, and so on. Okay. And uh, predictably, they would cut off the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, which would bottleneck the uh, international oil shipping, and shipping generally, but oil shipping uh, and, and energy uh, supplies around the world. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia has uh, has ways of delivering oil, has, has ways of exporting oil outside of the Strait of Hormuz. So does UAE. Uh, I'm not sure about Qatar, but they can probably piggyback with the UAE and with Saudi Arabia to get oil out. Iran also has a way to get oil out. But it will be a much reduced, uh, uh, drastically reduced amount of oil going out for export, which will obviously skyrocket the price of oil. Uh, that in and of itself would be good for the Gulf, uh, financially, it would be good for the Gulf, it would be good for the United States, because mm -hmm. the, uh, the United States is a net exporter. It would be very good for Russia, uh, who, who, who anyway, they're not, they, they wouldn't be in that bottleneck of the Strait of Hormuz. Well, huh? But anyone who's, you know, benefiting from Russian... Energy. It will hurt China and it will hurt the European. It will it will hurt, hurt Europe. Okay. Uh, as long as they're still boycotting yeah. uh, Russian oil, it yeah. will it will hurt it will hurt Europe. I mean, uh, but uh, to me, all of these scenarios are are just uh, you know hypothetical sort of fantasy scenarios that like the Pentagon plays, because I just don't see in real life anyone is is really wants there to be a war. Any serious person, mm -hmm. anyone who actually has something at stake would want there to be a war. The Iran Corporation report says that the U.S. is unprepared for global global war. Mm. If the neocons and Israel get their wider war in the region, how can they face possibly Russia or China if they interject? Yeah, and, and uh, Lavrov uh, made, a, made a statement where he said that, uh, like, uh, Sergei Lav Lavrov uh, made a statement that uh, uh, basically saying, or apparently only peace can, can uh, occur in the region uh, following a, a total war, oh, a to total region-wide war. I think uh, the, his statement was then sort of 
<coughs> uh, backtracked uh, by the foreign ministry saying this this shouldn't be understood as Russian policy, that we're advocating escalation. Uh -huh. I think that what he was probably trying to say was we will be involved. Right. Russia will be involved yeah. if there is a wider war. Uh, that's probably what he was trying to intimate. But but let's 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 bring it back to reality mm -hmm. a little bit and about what's maybe more plausible and what's more likely to, uh, in my opinion, uh, why this happened and how. Uh, in my opinion, as everyone knows who's been following Middle Nation for a while, uh, I believe that there is a plan for the region, for the Middle East, uh, that is being uh, pursued, being advanced by means of or, or, or under the uh, auspices of BRICS and the BRICS aligned, you can say, BRICS aligned faction of the OCGFC, which is, in my opinion, also the, 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 the richest and most powerful and influential faction of the OCGFC. The other faction of the OCGFC, when I refer to that, is basically the neocons, uh, which are kind of a relic, and, they're, and they're, their interests are exclusively tied to the military industrial complex. Uh, and so they are that faction. The military industrial complex is represented politically by the neocons. And they are always in favor of war, always, forever. Uh, and they don't care about whether or not America has a capacity to, to carry it out or not. They, they really don't care. And they don't care, like, for example, that Iran is actually in a better position militarily than they were 30 years ago when they were first, you know, dreaming about going to war with, with Iran. If they, had, if they had wanted to do it, they should have done it then. Now it's, it's, it, it would be a much more devastating and difficult thing to do. Anyway... Uh, this is this is uh, a fantasy of the neocons, and uh, the neocons obviously are also aligned with the Zionists. They're aligned with the maniac Netanyahu. Uh, but I don't believe that they're the most powerful faction. I don't believe that they're the most influential faction, uh, and I believe that the, the 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 more influential and more powerful faction is aligned with Saudi Arabia, with the GCC generally, uh, and with BRICS. And they would like to see uh, the Middle East become uh, sort of according to the, what is it called, the Vision 2030 of uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Okay. The idea of the Middle East becoming the new Europe. Because yeah. Europe is dead. Mm -hmm. As you can see right now, if just, just turn on the news, any news about anywhere in Europe, and you'll see right. the, 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 the decline of Europe before your eyes. You can just see Europe melting in front of your face. Uh, so Europe is in decline, Europe is dying, and there needs to be a new one. There needs to be a new center, a uh, commercial center, center of culture, uh, center of business, and so on, that is uh, accessible to the rest of the global south, uh, and that, or that has access, that provides access to, for example, Africa and to Asia, and of course that's the Middle East. Historically, the Middle East, so-called Middle East, uh, was the center of the world. For obvious reasons, for the reasons that it's the same, that for the and those reasons apply now. For the same reasons, it will again become the center of the world, because it has access to everything. You have access to Europe, you have access to Asia, you have access to Africa. The only thing you don't have access to is those uh, crazy people on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. uh, which warm. anyway leave them alone. And I'm sorry for Latin America that you're stuck with them, but come to Islam and we and you can solve that problem. Mm -hmm. But. Okay, so this is what I think. I think that part of this plan is for the uh, uh, end of Zionism, because Zionism, as I've said repeatedly, is bad for business, which, ever, which you can uh, also see before your eyes. Zionism is incredibly bad for business. They want Zionism, hardline Zionism, to end. They want a, uh, a permanent, long-lasting, well, that's what permanent means, permanent uh, solution to the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, so-called conflict. They want to end the genocide, but that's not really, frankly speaking, that's not their issue. They want the whole thing to be over. They want mm -hmm. the strife and the instability to be over. We want the area, that we want the region to be stable. What are the two main sources of instability? Um, obviously Israel. Uh -huh. Number one, the, the number one reason obviously is Israel. Yeah. But then the second reason is the resistance to Israel. Okay. Uh, and that is Hamas uh, and Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. And then also you have the, uh, you know, the factions in, uh, in Iraq, which means Iran. Yeah. So uh, 
getting you, you need to neutralize, uh, neutralize both of these things. Obviously, the most important one, as I've said before, if you want to end the resistance to the occupation, then you end the occupation. Mm -hmm. Well, they want to do that, but then what are you going to do with the resistance people after that? They need to be dealt with by one way or another. And in my opinion, uh, well, it's not an opinion. This is their stated position of the Arab Peace Plan of 2002. Uh, withdraw uh, of Israel to the 19, June 1967 borders. Mm -hmm. Uh, Palestinian state, recognition of Palestinian statehood, uh, U uh, UN membership for the state of Palestine with uh, PLO ruling over, uh, over Palestinian state. Two-state solution. Uh, this is what they want, this is what they're advocating. As I've said many times, I don't believe a two-state solution is actually viable and it will eventually have to turn into a one state. But for the time being, this is what they're pursuing because that's the legal framework that's internationally yeah, accepted that's and recognized. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't jump immediately to the one state thing right now. You need to try for the two state uh, and then see when that's not viable. Yeah. Then you can push for the one state. And the reason why you haven't been able to push for the one state before is because the ones that you've been negotiating with, well, it, the only one, the only people involved in negotiations up, in, up until now was the Palestinians, the Israelis, and the Americans. Right. But the negotiations now are going to be involved. the Palestinians and the entire global south. Mm -hmm. BRICS. Yeah. and the entire global south. It's going to be Russia, it's going to be China, it's going to be Saudi Arabia, it's going to be UAE, and everybody. Uh, and on the other side is going to be the Israelis. So they will take dictation. The terms will be dictated to them, and they will comply. Uh, so there's not a role for Hamas in the political future of Palestine. This is according to, this isn't, I'm not saying this is my opinion. Yeah. This is what I think their vision is. This is the vision of the people who are making these types of decisions and making these types of moves, and who will ultimately be the ones uh, to to um, run the yeah to run the show and and who are driving the agenda more than Washington is. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, the assassination assassination of Ismail Haniyeh uh, was an assassination by consensus. I think that he was sacrificed. Uh, may Allah forgive him and reward him with Jannah. Uh, but I think that he was sacrificed by. Uh, a consensus who say or who believe that Hamas has no political role uh, in Gaza uh, and and in a Palestinian state. Uh, and I believe that involved in that consensus, there are at least two parties, in my opinion, and that's I Iran and Israel. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I'm inclined to believe that uh, involved in that consensus was Iran, Israel, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and the Americans. And the only question in my mind is whether or not Russia was involved in, 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 in knows about that and whether China knows about that. I would guess that China wouldn't know about that because China has gone to a lot of trouble to try to bring the factions together. Uh, and it may be, it may be that Israel wanted to initiate it because they are recognizing, they can recognize that it is inevitable that there will be a post-war Gaza there, and the, and this the, the 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 terms of a post-war Gaza are largely going to be determined by the Gulf, right? Because you need them to rebuild, mm -hmm. and so that needs. Uh, and you need you need no one is going to go along with your idea for how the security should be, and how the administration should be. Because we just saw what the, uh, that uh, psychopath said at the Congress, Netanyahu, mm -hmm. what his vision uh, for a post-war Gaza was going to look like, which is exactly like it looks pre-war. It's just a continuation of occupation. Uh, uh, it's a continuation of Israel, uh, Israeli complete and total security and intelligence control over Gaza. It, it, it's just a continuation of occupation, and no one is going for that. Uh, the, the, the people who matter are not going for that anymore. Uh, so this is going to be determined by, mostly by the Khalij, in my opinion, and Allahu Alam. And so th they don't want Hamas involved politically. And the question is whether or not Hamas would agree to that or not, which they wouldn't. That, like, for example, look at Joe Biden. Just in your mind, put a picture in your mind of Joe Biden. Do you think he makes decisions about anything? Do you think that the people who actually have something at stake trust him to make decisions? Do you think that they'll trust the forever tipsy Kamala Harris to make decisions? And do you think that they'll trust Trump to make decisions? The only reason that why they might trust Trump to make decisions is because he's not a neocon. Because he's from the same class as them. And he's very close to the Gulf, he's very close to Saudi Arabia, 
And I think, and anyway, Jared Kushner is the one who was, who was his own, what is it, son-in-law, yeah. who was involved in the so-called Abraham Accords, bringing this all together. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they're all on the same page. I think Trump and, the, and, the, and, and that faction of the OCGFC uh, and the uh, Khalij, they're all on the same page. And so everyone who thinks that, that if Trump gets in, it's going to be worse and he's more Zionist, I'm afraid you're mistaken. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong, but it's not likely. The whole thing about what I, I, my, my personal belief also is that this, this whole plan uh, for resolving the situation mm-hmm. includes, in it the in, it of- includes in it the fact that out of nowhere, Hamas suddenly... Yeah. has the ability to conduct Wagner-style special operations, commando-style special operations, with remarkable efficiency and sophistication and coordination, something that they have never had any experience or track record doing ever before. Uh-huh. Paragliding. You can think what you want to think. You can have your, whatever opinion you want to have about it. Uh-huh. But in my, in my opinion, the realistic opinion is that uh, the new capabilities, the new uh, uh, capacity of Hamas has been enabled by the factions that I'm talking about, mm-hmm. including the Khalij, including Saudi Arabia, including the UAE, including the Gulf, uh, and including Russia, and including Wagner. And there are reports about this. Mm-hmm. There are reports about Wagner uh, training Hamas. There are reports about Wagner people being in Gaza. Mm-hmm. And I believe that. I don't, I don't see any reason not to believe it. I don't know how you could not believe it. I don't know. If you're, if you're, if you're new to the whole situation, and if you're new to Hamas, maybe you, I don't know, have a different understanding of what Hamas is. Maybe you first heard about Hamas on October 7th. Yeah, and you have a you know, classical resistance. Yeah. You know. I've, I've, I've been knowing Hamas for the last a quarter century. Uh, I have a familiarity with their capabilities. And just realistically, like I said, I have an understanding, just a basic understanding of the fact that they have not participated in combat. They're not Hezbollah. They have gotten some training from Hezbollah, yes. But their connection with Iran in this regard is old news. Uh, pre uh, Hamas control over Gaza. That's when they were getting support from, from Iran. And since they had control over Gaza, they've been supported by Qatar. I have news for you. They've been supported by Qatar. Without Qatar, they wouldn't have been able to exist as an administration in Gaza. Uh, so they didn't have this kind of capacity before. And they suddenly got this capacity at the same time when? that uh, the relationships uh, solidified between uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, uh, China, they joined BRICS and so on, mm-hmm. uh, and when the, when when uh, uh, UAE was using uh, mercenaries like the RSF uh-huh. in Yemen, uh, in Libya, alongside Wagner, and uh, Hamas was meeting with uh, Russia, they had meetings in Russia, mm-hmm. they had meetings in Moscow, and uh, and in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, Hezbollah also, uh, there's, there's, there, there's no reason to believe, and I think that there is every reason to not believe uh, that, that, that uh, Wagner is not involved and that Russia is not involved. If, if, you, if you actually think that out of nowhere, yeah, Hamas has had, had the capacity to do these, these kinds of operations that require training, not just training, Experience. Yeah, training experience. They, 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 subhanallah, what they've been doing, what they did on October seventh, and everything that we've seen them what, what, that we've seen them do since then. The, these are experienced fighters, who are in charge of other fighters and training other fighters on the ground in real time. So I don't believe for a second that this is something that actually just uh, uh, organically popped up in in Gaza, coincidentally at the same time that Wagner is everywhere that Wagner is in Syria, that Wagner is helping Hezbollah, that Wagner is in Libya, that Wagner is in Yemen, uh, and, and in so many other places. Because, because, because I, I, I believe that, that the plan for the, uh, that the Khalij has, and that this faction of the OCGFC has, which uh, 
uh, as ugly as it is to us, as distasteful as it is to us, will include BlackRock, will include Jared Kushner. I was saying this in a, in a video recently, I think. Uh, but it will result in the development of Gaza. It will result in the development of Palestine. It will result in an end to the violent conflict. And uh, unquestionably, that's better for everyone. Yeah, and the Except for Hamas. Yeah. It's not better for Hamas or any of the, the, the militant factions. And, the, and, and the, 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 the situation for specifically for Palestine, specifically for Gaza, uh, what I believe there, as I say, their vision, the vision of the, of the Gulf and that faction of the OCGFC mm -hmm. is for the Arab Peace Plan of 2002, which is for the PLO to be in charge, Fatah. Right. And Fatah has the advantage mm -hmm. of being deeply corrupt, and, uh, unideological, mm -hmm and completely uh, willing to obey and to uh, be obsequious mm -hmm. to whoever is going to sponsor them. Yeah. So, so that's okay. what you want. If you want to actually be in charge, but you, but you can't have uh, Gaza become part of Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. or become the, what, uh, the eighth emirate mm -hmm. of the UAE, it has to be its own state, it has mm -hmm. to be its own uh, country, so it has to have its own ruler. Mm -hmm. But that ruler has to belong to you. It has to be in your pocket. Yeah. It has to essentially be like an like a governor during the time of Khilafa. There's, yeah. there's the Khalif and then there's the governors. The governors have a certain degree of autonomy, yeah. but there's also a degree of centralization where they have to report back to the Khalifa. Right. The pact, allegiance. Right. The bayat. Yeah. So it's like that. The, the, this is this is the way the Khalid wants it. I believe this is the way MBS wants it. I believe that basically. I'm going to have a governor in Syria, a governor in Palestine, which will include Israel, mm -hmm. a governor in Jordan, and so on. Yep. Because he can call himself a king, Jordan, a king of Jordan can call himself a king, but you don't have anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, You've got nothing. Yeah. You're, you're a beggar king, I'm sorry. Uh, with all due respect, you're a beggar king. And, and CC, you can call yourself a president, you can call yourself a prime minister, what have you, mm -hmm. but someone else is in charge. Because they control the money. And because, not just because they control the money, frankly. Because they, can, they control the money and uh, they have a vision. Uh, they have a plan. And they have the ability to put it into effect. But like, but like, like if, okay, now, I, I, in fact, early, early on, many, many months ago, I did do a video where I talked about the possibility of war with Iran and how that and and how that would play out because when you're talking about something like the the, the people who have the kind of stakes uh, uh, the kind of interests at stake uh, that the OCGFC have that like the Black Rocks and who Black Rock represents because they're the controllers of capital not the owners mm -hmm. the owners are uh, who they work for mm -hmm. Black Rock is the C in OCGFC mm -hmm. uh, what they have at stake Obviously, they're not going to put all their eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. They will be ready for all contingencies. And that's why I, I was first talking about what, how things would play out if there was a war. If there was a war with Iran, it turns out quite well for Saudi Arabia. It turns out quite well at the end of all of that for the GCC. Iran is demolished, mm -hmm. which means Hezbollah is gone, which means the Houthis are gone, which means Hamas is gone also. Uh, and which means the entire region, the entire Bilad Hashem, is up for grabs. It's yours for the taking, which includes Palestine. It includes Israel, it in because Israel will also be destroyed yeah. drastically. There are, look at look at look at look at the economic damage they've suffered. Yeah, economic just damage. just with the war against uh, uh, with the, with the genocide in in Gaza. With just that, their economy is is uh, yeah definitely. in collapse. Yeah. And their and their people are fleeing. Leaving, yeah. Can you imagine if drone. can you imagine if actual missiles, not firecrackers, if actual missiles were landing on Tel Aviv, in Haifa, mm. if 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 they were actually being, if they were experiencing proper war, mm. you wouldn't find you barely find a Jew there. Yeah. But anyway, so they'd be demolished. That's theirs for the taking. Lebanon, theirs for the taking, yeah. and Syria, Syria yeah. theirs for the taking. 
all so so even even if you think about this this is also why there's these all of these steps all of these moves to normalize with like Bashar al-Assad because yeah. we know anything could happen next yeah. if it ha if it goes if it goes sideways we're on we, we have what to do that needs to be a coordinated and if it goes that sideways we also know what to do